I'll let you take okay. it. <laughs> so again, I'm Claudia Kirk. I am a 2023 Master Gardener. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also a veterinary internist at the University of Tennessee. And so this happened to be a personal interest, um, both because my inspiration include my own dog, Sam, and he's waiting for me to finish roasting coffee beans so that he can try to steal the ones I drop, which is highly toxic. He's also known as the thief, and so anything I'm trimming, pruning, or planting, he's liable to steal and run across the lawn. And then here is the plant addict in my house, Rosie, and you can see the corn plant behind that is toxic. So uh, any, any day of the week, I might have to kind of wonder what her behavior is doing and where she is in terms of plant toxicities. So we're going to cover um, just some basic things about plant toxicity at a high level. Um, we're going to talk about toxic plants that you might have in the home, in the garden, and maybe native or naturalized plants. And it was kind of hard to select from over 1,500 toxic plants that are described mm -hmm. in people, children, and, and pets. Um, and so the, the plants I chose were the ASPCA, um, Poison Control, and AKC. They kind of posed a top 10, top 20, and I had um, some that were for livestock a little more concerning. So we'll cover those plants um, on an overview, and then we'll, I'll give you a little bit of a list of some non-toxic plants, and then strategies to prevent toxicity and what to do if you, um, your child, or a pet um, happens to consume a plant. So as I mentioned, there's over 1,500 poisonous plants that have been described. Um, and they can be anywhere from extremely minor to deadly, causing acute death. You walk out in the field and your horses are all dead. Mm -hmm. um, the ASPCA Poison Control Center kind of shepherds about thousands of call a year. And they're strictly uh, dedicated to dogs, cats, and horses. And they identify um, 1,028 plants that they note are toxic and they've had calls about. And about 400 plus are relevant to cats, dogs, and horses, and they're getting great size. The Poison Control Center, the one for people, they manage over 200, uh, 2 million encounters um, over the year. And those include drugs and um, you know, chemicals and so forth that might be uh, toxic. About 50,000 of those are animals and 2 million are humans. So they will answer questions about pets and people. And what they found is, or what they reported in 2022, is about 2% or 50,000 um, of their calls were plant-related toxicities. And of the plant-related toxicities, 28,000 were children. And those were typically children under the age of six. So that's really your target population where you're really worried for those. Um, and even though that 2 and 3% sounds really low, um, fentanyl and opioid toxicity was about 13%. So they have a wide group of categories. So that still represents a significant number of toxicities. And so that's kind of why we care. Um, there are a variety of signs and symptoms that occur with plant toxicities or poisonings um, in pretty much every body system, as you read here. So the gastrointestinal tract is the most common with maybe burning in the mouth, vomiting and diarrhea, um, followed by some breathing difficulty up to respiratory failure and paralysis, neurologic signs, heart function, so slow beat, fast beat, arrhythmias, cardiac arrest um, occurs, especially with the cardiac glycosides, and then kidney, liver, skin, and sudden death. And we won't talk too much about skin this time because I'm really more concerned about those that are gonna be um, highly toxic. And if you look at the list here on your right, you'll see that there's a number of toxins, and some you probably recognize, like cyanide. And there's a number of plants, even ones that we look at the yard, like hydrangeas, that we don't think are particularly toxic. But those contain a cyanide and, large, and consumed in large amounts. Generally, that would be by an animal. could be very, very deadly and cause respiratory failure. And then um, somebody was asking me about um, dermatologic irritations, and many plants have resins, so uh, poinsettias and um, pokeweed and things like that, and those are known to cause dermal irritation and even photosensitivity. And so again, a whole host of clinical signs that may re be related to plant toxins. When you're thinking about plant toxins, it's not just the plant that you have to think about. There's three factors, plant factors, animal factors, and people factors. 
And each of those interplay to really consider how toxic that plant is going to be if there's been an ingestion. And so the plant, we want to know what's the plant, what's the environment, what part was eaten, what growth stages it is, because some young plants are more toxic than, than old plants and vice versa. Is it wilted? So Johnson grass um, is a plant that animals graze on in the pasture, but if it's wilted or been sprayed by herbicide, it is highly toxic. It releases cyanide, can cause respiratory failure in that particular one. So knowing what your plant looks like is important. The animal size, weight, age, the amount eaten, did they eat it all at once or have they been eating it over a course of time? can have an influence on the toxicity signs, and then certainly the season, the soil, the weather, so environmental factors. So each of those are important in identifying how toxic that, that exposure might be. So as we go to specific plants, what is the bane of my existence in the ICU? And that's gonna be lilies. And if you were my friend, never send me a bouquet of Easter lilies or day lilies or um, tiger lilies because for the cat, all parts of the plant are extremely toxic. They cause acute renal failure. The pollen, if the cat brushes up against the pollen and grooms their skin, if they drink the water, um, this is one of the most common toxicities we see in the ICU. Wow. And for those cats, if it was a little exposure with very good care, they may recover. They could have long-term kidney damage or oftentimes either require dialysis and that can be cops prohibitive for a lot of people and so that makes them make a difficult decision to euthanize their pet because of full kidney failure. Um, what looks like a lily, which is not quite as, in, as toxic, and I will highlight that the um, little toxic sign over on the side usually indicates that plant as we go through is, is going to be deadly, um, is amaryllis. It looks like a lily, but it's not quite as toxic. Um, the leaves and stems contain an alkaloid, and then there's oxalate crystals in the bulb. So it can cause gastrointestinal signs, may cause some oral and, and abdominal pain, and if eaten in high amounts, um, can cause tremors. And so it's not nearly as toxic as the lily plant. And the lily is toxic really just to cats. So you can see mild signs in dogs and people, um, but the cat is highly, um, highly fatal. So I mentioned amaryllis has calcium oxalate, may cause pain. Um, there's over 215 plant families that have oxalate containing um, little cells that I think are called idiophobes. And so in those cells, um, they can have these long crystals like you see here. And those are the stinging crystals that you get if you walk by stinging nettles, or if you eat something like dumb cane, and that can cause a release of those crystals in the mouth and cause extreme pain, irritation, swelling, um, breathing difficulties. Um, these oxalate crystals are really common. They can be used as defense for the plant. So if you're a stinging nettle, you're probably not gonna have deer eat you a lot if you kind of cause this little sharp spines um, in the mouth of the deer. So that can be a very useful defense. Um, they can help detoxify certain minerals and they regulate calcium within the plant. And they come in long spikes or they can come in little globules. But those that we're more concerned about generally are going to be the ones that have the little spikings because of the oral irritation. Um, and they can lead to difficulty swallowing and difficulty breathing if you get enough swelling in the oral mucosa. So we'll find that we've got a lot of plants that contain oxalate. And so which are those? Um, some of our best loved plants. The monstera is um, going to be a very common one, the philodendron, those in the philodendron family. Peace lilies, peace lilies aren't probably quite as um, oxalate filled, so a little bit of munching does not cause too many problems, but that can be toxic as well. Put those dunking and a lot of other plants in your environment. And so if you've got a plant chewer, you want to really be aware of these particular plants. And you do in your handout have the list of all of these um, in your plant list. I just included everything we talked about in your list. Well, what about aloe vera? Yeah. Um, I would guess who knew that aloe vera was toxic? Mm -hmm. So aloe vera um, and aloe uh, barbadense are toxic. Aloe retusa is non-toxic. And saponins and glycosides are throughout the entire plant except the gel. So putting it on yourself or if you buy aloe vera gel that you drink for health reasons, 
Um, that is non-toxic because it's the one area of the plant that doesn't contain some of these glycosides and saponins. Um, but if the, the animals are eating them, vomiting, lethargy, diarrhea, and maybe this red urine that is not metabolized. Um, and I will say that this is one of my favorite uh, plants that my cat finds that she will use as a purgative on a regular basis. So as I was doing, the, doing this, you know, the plant comes in um, from outside and has to go back outside um, in the, once the weather gets warm because she is uh, a little bit addicted to this particular plant despite the fact that it causes GI signs. Um, the dracaena, corn, ribbon plants, um, those are all also have saponins, also cause gastrointestinal signs as well. Um, you might see a little neurologic sign with dilated pupil. Again, you'll notice these don't have the little toxic symbol, so even though they're toxic, they'll cause signs in your animal that you may wonder about, or children, so um, the fact that I doesn't specify that these are dog or cat toxins, um, they are also toxins that will cause the same sign in children. And then poinsettia, does, who thinks poinsettias are toxic? That's the one that we all say is kind of overblown. It's got some mild irritation. It's probably, it's listed in the toxins for plant toxicity, but for the most part, just a little mild mouth irritation and some stomach irritation. And it's probably overrated. And in fact, it's overrated as reported from the Poison Control Center. So that was their words. I should put quotes around it. So it's not particularly toxic, even though I think most people um, say, oh, I've got cats, I can't have poinsettias. It's, it's not the one you need to worry about. Lily for your cats is gonna be the big one. Well, moving on into the garden, there's a number of these that might be in the garden or the house. And um, a kind of top 10 plant especially for dogs and for children, is sago palm. Um, so the cycads are highly toxic. Every part of the plant is toxic, but particularly the seed or the nut, that's attractive to dogs, attractive to young children who put it in their mouth. And um, it can cause severe GI signs, but our biggest concern is that liver failure usually follows any kind of ingestion. You don't have to eat a lot. Um, chewing on a nut if you're a two-year-old is enough to uh, create a really severe toxicity in that particular plant. And it can lead to neurologic signs as well as liver failure, ataxia, and death, usually over the course of a few days. So it's not normally a sudden death plant, unlike some of the others. What's blooming in my yard right now, which is lovely, the azaleas, um, rhododendrons, and all of the plants in the rhododendron family um, have cardiac glycosides, and they are highly toxic. So a couple leaves being well chewed is enough to, to um, cause death in a um, child, and maybe more so, you'd have to eat more in a person or in an animal. Um, initially starts out with stomach upset, but then moves on these cardiac glycosides, go into a regular heartbeat, slow, fast, and then there can be cardiac arrest. Um, or seizure and death. And so while we really enjoy these, this is one that if you're pruning or trimming and you have a thief like I have who wants to go ahead and steal what you've got and run around the yard and chew on it, um, this would be a bad one that, that you'll want to make sure that you provide some exclusion as you're managing that particular plant. And then one that's right outside that always catches my eye is you. You, all parts of the plant, are exceptionally hot, um, toxic. This is a plant that causes sudden death. So you walk mm -hmm. out, if your neighbors trim their you plants, and then through the, the um, trimmings over the fence, thinking maybe the horse or the cattle would like it, um, it will absolutely wake up to dead animals. Um, the berries are especially toxic, and they are toxic, highly toxic to children and attractive to children. Interestingly enough, oh, Guess what? Can we skip this now? Um, interestingly um, enough, the um, completely lost my train of thought there. But overall, um, that is one that you know when I ask my um, garden designer to put in plants, make sure there's no to toxins. He had three of those plants right in the front, and so not even your garden designer. Um, might know that these are toxic plants. So being very proactive and aware is gonna be critical. A plant that's not really common, but some people will plant it as a gopher deterrent in the garden is castor. 
Castor is another one of those highly toxic plants. It contains a compound called ricine, um, and only one to two seeds from this plant can kill an adult human being. It's been um, used in Kansas. I remember a case of uh, a husband trying to kill a wife, and so it can be <laughs> acutely toxic. Um, if you go ahead and consume the ricine, or a little bit over time, which was this scenario, um, probably was a court case file, um, it can result in uh, severe GI signs, real severe uh, bloody diarrhea, straining, and, and collapse. And so being very careful with this plant, and even rosary peas is another plant that's very similar. Um, people will use it to make jewelry because the nuts are very pretty. And so this is where children often get a hold of them, chewing on either rosary peas or um, the castor bean nut, which has been kind of glossed and lacquered and made into a, a jewelry. Oleander, um, I'm originally from California, and it fills the environment. Every um, intersection, every uh, median has oleander, oleander, oleander. There's a reason deer don't like oleander, and they don't want to be poisoned. And it is extremely toxic to all species. Um, one leaf can kill a child, severe vomiting, death, um, change in heart rate, and it has a cardiac glycoside. So somewhat similar to azaleas and rhododendrons. Other cardiac glycosides having some of those same symptoms are foxgloves. Love foxgloves, not in my garden. Um, and so those, lily of the valley, calancho, um, milkweed, uh, dogbane, star of Bethlehem, those are all plants that contain cardiac glycosides that if eaten can certainly have severe um, changes to the heart and ultimately death. And usually it doesn't take a lot from those plants. Calancho and lily of the valley, not as toxic as things like the um, foxglove or oleander. And then, um, Kind of as we move toward the bulbs, the autumn crocus, and this is a plant that I'm not really very familiar with and haven't seen an animal with a toxicity associated with it, but it has been reported in children and some animals as highly, highly toxic. Uh, again, severe GI bleeding, liver and kidney damage, and respiratory arrest. And so the bulb is more toxic than the actual flower plant, but all parts of the plant are toxic. Um, and so of the bulbs, it's probably the baddie. When we look at the lily family with tulips, hyacinths, and daffodils, as opposed to the Easter lily portion of the family, primarily the bulbs are toxic. So when I was planting my tulips, um, I was trying to keep them close, but sure enough, the thief stole one and resulted in me getting 10,000 steps that day as I, <laughs> as I chased him to get that bulb out of his mouth. Um, so had he consumed it, nausea, vomiting, oral irritation, and some difficulty swallowing. So not, not normally life-threatening, but certainly something that will get you into the ER if you have. Um, hydrangeas, we talked about that. You know, mild lethargy, vomiting, pretty much in all species, the leaves and the flower itself are the most toxic, but the branches and the roots and stems are also toxic. And when in the, the GI tract, that can release a cyanide-like material. Burning may also release some smoke with some cyanides, and so you have to sometimes be careful. Those of you that have poison oak or ivy know that bad thing to kind of burn mm -hmm. those oils, the urshirol, um, is kind of volatilized. And so some of the plants that are toxic, we may have some problems with um, volatilization. It, it's not incredibly toxic, so you take a bite and you're going to kind of keel over from cyanide toxicity, but it's important to remember that animals or children that are eating a lot, especially the flowers or leaves, would be at risk and that would, should prompt you to at least call poison control. And then um, I think most of us are aware that you know our parents have at one point told us not to eat the apple seeds or the cherry pits because they contain cyanide. All of the stem fruits um, have cyanide in the pits or the seeds, and if you consume a large enough number of them as they are digested, um, especially apple seeds because that coat is a little bit thinner than something like a cherry seed or a peach pit, um, those can cause significant toxicity with um, actually death. And so I think in the 2022 um, annual report from the Poison Control Center, they did report a death associated with cyanide toxicity 
uh, related to apple seed uh, excessive consumption. So it's not just a few seeds in the apple, it's a, a larger amount, so more likely if you're feeding um, an animal, but um, certainly you don't want to crack open a peach pit and you know, kind of have that mimic an almond, for example. So those can be extremely toxic related to the cyanide levels. So some additional ones in the garden just to be aware of is cyclamen, um, lantana, periwinkle, and what's highly toxic is the anconetum. Um, I will say that um, this little fairy is mine, and at the age of two, she hadn't eaten for about three days, and the first thing she did was walk over and um, have a little bite of a lantana flower. And lantana contain alkaloids. It's not normally considered particularly toxic, but in young children, um, it can cause liver failure, and the same in dogs and cats. The berries are the most toxic, but the flower is toxic as well. And so I got to experience what syrup of epicac does um, in a young <laughs> child that has finally decided to eat, but then ate the lantana as well. Um, the big one on this list, again, is anconetum. Um, there have been deaths reported to that. That's the um, monk's food or wolf's vein. And it is highly toxic, causing heart disease or heart um, arrhythmias and paralysis. And the one thing is that it's not typically consumed in the garden. So pets and animals seem to kind of not necessarily want to grab it. And where you typically find the toxicity reported in this is that it is in a lot of herbal remedies for various things. And so the reports from Poison Control Center have suggested that um, they be cautious with the herbal preps and there's been fatal toxicities associated to some of those. So you don't only have to worry about what's in your yard and garden, but if you're taking natural or alternative medication or plants, um, you need to kind of be cautious because those values are usually not well controlled and some of the plants like can be highly toxic. And then moving to some of the top natives of concern. And so depending upon where you are, I live on a farm, and so there are a variety of natives as well as naturalized plants that are not necessarily natives, and I've included all of those here. The top ones are gonna be hemlock, and I think we all remember the story about Socrates having to drink the, the hemlock potion or tincture. Um, and so poison hemlock and water hemlock are both deadly. Um, and they can cause death within a short period of time. The problem with them, even though they're very uncommon in our environment, is um, they are really hard to tell from things like cow parsnip, they look like Queen Anne's lace. Um, the water hemlock kind of has an open tubular structure and children have been intoxicated um, by kind of cutting them and using it as like a straw, like a pea shooter and just putting their mouth around it to um, use it as a pea shooter has caused toxicity and death. And so um, it's best, unless you're really identifying your plant, not to um, play with these, to go ahead and use gloves if you are um, working with them. And unless you're absolutely positive that it's not a hemlock um, or a giant hogweed, which I did here, here, um, these are highly toxic and you really should avoid handling them or maybe getting rid of them if they're on your property. So um, uncommon, but deadly. So that's a concern with them. The other is jimson weed, um, sometimes called thorn apple due to these little kind of cucumbery look fruits that it has. Um, those can be in the wild or in the uh, disturbed area of pastures. And again, extremely um, toxic, all parts of the plants. They have scopolamine and alkaloids and it causes neuromuscular changes like twitching and depression as well as convulsions, coma, and death. And so um, again, in 2022, there was a report of a human with gypsum weed toxicity as well. Um, lots of times kids, or this might be a little bit younger child, looking at this thinking, oh, is that like a cucumber and can I eat that? And so um, those are very um, highly uh, concerned. And then um, we have deadly nightshade. And so this is an example um, of deadly nightshade. You might find that as a weed in your garden. Um, and early on, when it is growing, is when it's, um, and it's early in its stage and it has the young green berries is when it's most toxic. If a child eats the green berries, very few of those are deadly. 
two berries, as a matter of fact, is all they have to eat um, to be fatal. When they get more mature and they're the nice dark purple berries, which you know hopefully is maybe a stage if they got a hold of them um, that they would be more attracted to, um, is less toxic but not necessarily safe. So again, age of the plant, if you're going to have to call poison control, is really helpful where the berries, the berries green, where the berries purple, um, helps both both the healthcare team as well as poison control um, tell what you need to um, do in terms of managing that particular toxicity. And again, seizures and death is a common, <coughs> is a common sign um, of that. And then Chinese lantern or phasalis, um, who plants phasalis in their garden or conquered. So there's Chinese lantern, also a member of the tomatillo family as well. And so the, the entire plant is super toxic, except for the fruit. And so if you're making tomatillos, great. Don't eat the husk. Um, and children shouldn't eat or play with, if you've got the little lanterns out and you're doing craft projects, um, just remember that those are extremely toxic as part of the nightshade family. Um, the nightshade has the solanines, and that even includes tomatoes. We eat tomato fruit, but if you chew on the tomato leaf, um, that is going to be toxic and generally cause GI signs if it's a tomato, but certainly can cause circulatory and respiratory collapse associated with the Chinese lantern. So again, that is a concerning plant that's highly toxic that you want to be very cautious about in the environment and allowing access to pets and people. And this time of year is kind of tough. It's mushroom season in my yard and probably yours. And certainly we see a number of patients that come in with mushroom toxicity. The most concerning is Amanita um, and the death cap version of that. Um, they can have various signs from mild gastrointestinal, not the death cap, but mushrooms, um, can be mildly irritating from a GI standpoint to deadly with the death cap causing acute liver failure to hallucinogenic. And so we have seen all of those things happen in the ICU. And, and one of the you know most difficult cases I've had has been a sweet little young dog that had gotten eaten some mushrooms, probably death cap, and had gone into profound um, liver failure. And so that was kind of hard to lose that particular um, animal. And you have to be cautious unless you are a mushroom expert. Um, when you're either foraging for mushrooms um, or having mushrooms in your yard, then they very much could be toxic. And so if a child or an animal has um, eaten one of these, you do want to collect the mushrooms and um, take them so to the poison control or to the healthcare provider to try to get them um, identified because some are going to require um, maybe dialysis or plasma exchange and in pets, we certainly can give you an idea. If they're hallucinogenic, they usually get over that with time, but those that have liver failure are incredibly toxic. Mistletoe, um, there's two forms. There's a European mistletoe and an American mistletoe. And so the American is the Phorodendron um, species. There's a couple different type, and the white berries are very attractive, and sometimes when you bring them in to hang them over your holiday decorations, um, dogs or cats or kids may go ahead and sample those little white berries. And they generally, in the American version, can cause just mild GI signs. But if they're eaten in large amounts, Again, they can lead to death. That's extremely rare, and there's very few um, reports of death associated with mistletoe intoxication in the U.S. In Europe, their mistletoe is a, a bit more um, poisonous. But white berries are generally a bad sign in any plant, so you can kind of say, mm -hmm. no, I'm not going to eat the white berries. They're generally poisonous. And then I didn't want to forget plant molds. Um, this is aflatoxin on corn. Um, you may have heard of pet food recalls or, or livestock recalls, and that's generally because of the corn. Um, it may not be nearly as apparent of this, but certain plants and fruiting bodies can have molds on them, and some can be highly toxic, like aflatoxin. That causes um, severe liver failure in a very small amount. Um, there are neurologic toxins, so tremorogens in California, a real popular one to have come into the ER um, for, can be animals and kids, although kids don't typically eat it, is moldy walnut toxicity. And so they come in kind of big blown dilated eyes 
and just have tremors um, all over and again require supportive care. But we have black walnuts here and so there's um, certainly it's reasonable if they were accumulated in an area um, that an animal chewed on that you might see those clinical signs as well. And then there's a number of um, GI side effects, so vomitoxins, so overtoxins and vomitoxin A and B that are out there that can affect any of the vegetative matter. So if you are um, dealing with kind of things that are moldy, um, you shouldn't eat it and neither should your pet for your livestock. And kind of concluding some of the ones that I think are less common um, are going to be mountain laurel, which its nickname is sheep till. That should tell you right off the bat, that's maybe not a good plant to eat. And so typically in, in these mountainous areas where there's not a lot of grass, um, the livestock that forage on them. It's got a, uh, it's highly toxic, it's got a cardiac glycoside among others, and so um, can cause heart arrhythmias, coma, and death. Um, so it's one that, again, you'd want to be, want to be cautious with if you have it in your landscape and have kids, they might be curious about that. And one that I'm really sad about is buckeye, because I really want to plant a native buckeye, but the thief is not trustworthy. And when these fall down to the ground, they are highly attractive, again, especially to kids and to dogs, not so much to livestock. Um, and it is highly toxic in all species, people, pets, livestock. Um, generally, it can cause neurologic signs and paralysis and coma and death. And so, um, in less than, it took more than 10 years for that plant to make um, the nuts on it, um, it won't be on my property because I can guarantee that that would be way too tempting for the thief. Um, tobacco, flowering tobacco, even eating tobacco from cigarettes can be highly toxic. And again, cardiac signs and neurologic signs can occur. Um, the flowers are extremely toxic in the flowering um, tobacco. And then we have pokeweed, our friend in the garden with the deep tap root. Um, the berries can be confused sometimes with elderberry. Some people are like, oh, they're small purple berries. Maybe that's elderberry. Um, highly toxic, but it's also a skin irritant. And so even though I didn't talk about a lot of the resins that cause dermatitis or irritation because it was not really the focus, this is one that you should be wearing gloves. Um, you should protect your skin. The sap or the resin, if you're cutting it off and getting it on something and touching yourself later, can cause a pretty profound dermatitis. And eating it can cause um, significant gastrointestinal signs in terms of bloating and vomiting and GI pain. So pokeweed, um, birds love it. They love to paint your car with it, but um, <laughs> you need to kind of be cautious about both handling it as well as making sure there's no access. So, very briefly, in the kitchen, um, just a reminder that there are many plant-like products that are toxic to your pet that we can eat. So children can have these. Um, things that we wouldn't normally think of. And um, chocolate and coffee, for example, have theobromines and caffeine, which is toxic to dogs and cats. Um, grapes and raisins, and we don't entirely know. They think it's a, an alkaloid in those, but um, for some reason, however they're treated, some are fine. You know, you may grow up and say, I used to give my dog grapes all the time when I was growing up, which was true. Um, but it can certainly cause kidney failure in dogs and in cats. Cats usually don't eat them as well. And any stage of the grapes um, can be toxic. And although it's not exactly a plant, um, we do find xylitol and things like peanut butter. And this is a brand that uses xylitol as a non-nutritive sweetener. And it is extremely deadly in pets. Um, it is the liver thinks that it's sugar and it grabs a hold of it and kind of doesn't process it like sugar. And suddenly the animal, it's um, glucose metabolizing, metabolizing um, system gets blocked and the animal becomes profoundly hypoglycemic to the point that even giving IV glucose solution may not um, prevent them from going into liver failure and having a severe hypoglycemic coma. So caution, there's a few things out there, gum, peanut butter, toothpaste that we see xylitol in, and you need to be aware of that. Certainly peanut butter is a big concern if you're using peanut butter to pill your pet, for example. Onions and garlic, um, the, the best, toxicity that I had, which is actually sad for the dog, was a um, caramelized onion from Bloomingdale's when I was working in New York. 
and the owner was so mad because there's this small little package that the dog ate the whole little onion package and it was this very gourmet Dean and DeLuca caramelized onion. The dog got them all and then he was about 10 grand back 20 years ago um, after he got his blood transfusion for hemolysis secondary the, to the onion consumption. So um, any type of onions and garlic can be toxic um, as well as academia nuts. So, you know, your friends send you chocolate covered macadamia nuts that you have out on the counter and they can cause neurologic signs. Any difference with the onions and cooked versus uncooked? No. And toxics? Because you no. always hear that cooked onions are fine for dogs. No. Not sure. No. Whoever's telling you that is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't my best. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> no, even the juice, you know, but small amounts obviously they tolerate. But a big consumption, like you know, eating a three ounce bag of caramelized onion, um, despite the fact that owner got none, um, which is why it was really bad, <laughs> um, is they can be toxic at all forms. So the sulfites in there, there's a disulfide that can bind to the red blood cell, and that causes hemolysis of the red blood cell. Garlics may be a little bit um, less toxic, and some breeders will feed garlic as an immunotherapy. Um, and not to say that it doesn't have great immune function, but they had a Frenchie and a Rottweiler, and the Rottweiler dropped his garlic, and the Frenchie got it, and that was a little Frenchie that got to spend some time with me as well for the same reason. So we did a transfusion and had um, pretty significant hemolysis of its blood. Rhubarb leaves, um, you all are aware that rhubarb leaves uncooked um, certainly can have some toxins and cause some kidney damage. And then just as a reminder, while we don't really eat tomato leaves, they're not terribly palatable. Um, if you have a goofy dog, you know, this would be perfect thing for a Labrador to eat, for example, um, because they will eat anything. So, um, so those, those are just a reminder of some things that are in our kitchen that are plant-based that we need to think about. Well, what about non-toxic plants? Um, there are loads of them. And so um, when we talk about resources, I'll show you where to go. And um, I don't have that on your plant list, but African violets, spider plant plants, areca palms. And again, you need to know the scientific and botanical name because there's a number of palms that are toxic, particularly sago. But the areca palm, the really pretty one that, you know, is kind of at the front of Kroger's that they're trying to sell you, those generally are non-toxic. Um, the bromelades, Boston fern, bottle palm, or ponytail palm, those are all going to be uh, pretty much safe in the environment and make nice substitutions for um, the plants that you might want to not necessarily have kids and, and pets uh, next to. Um, the Christmas cactus or Thanksgiving cactus, um, if you want succulents, burrows tail, and then the one lily that might be okay is the canna lily. Um, so they tend to not be toxic. And then big plants that are really nice flowering in your garden, peonies are um, lovely examples as well. So these are just a snapshot of a few of the non-toxic plants that you can consider in your house. And I would encourage you to go to the um, ASPCA site and look for non-toxics. Um, or on um, one of the other resources to kind of say we're non-toxic if you want to remove these from your house. So prevention. Um, first and foremost, know your plant's botanical name because there's many in the same category, like lupin. There's really poisonous lupin and there's non-poisonous lupin. There are poisonous begonias and there's non-poisonous begonias. And so you really do need to know the, the genus name and the species name when you're tracking your plants to understand whether it has a toxic potential or not. Um, you know, you can't avoid all toxic plants in your environment, and my house is filled with toxic plants. Um, but they're not the really bad toxic plants. So again, sago palm and lily are never going to be in my household. I wanted the buckeye. I won't be there either. Um, exclusion, so elevated spaces, close the room, fence the area. Um, when the animals or the kids are out, um, you know, this, this kitty is just asking for an ER visit. And then um, <laughs> when you're planting or you're um, pruning, be very aware that your interest in those plants kind of garners the interest of maybe your pet or your child. Mm -hmm. And so um, pay close attention, try to exclude them from the area, 
pick up those prunies and don't leave them for a long period of time so that they can get them and play with them. Um, and then never toss clippings or pruning to livestock or your neighbor's animals over the fence. So um, again, if you were pruning azalea, that could be highly toxic, just even a small amount to a horse or someone that would come over and chew on it. Be careful with burning, um, and you should wear gloves because many of these, though we didn't discuss them, if they've got any kind of white sappy excretion, so even the ficus in your household, if you're if you're trimming your weeping fig, um, has that white resin, and that can cause a dermatitis associated with that as well. So gloves and maybe sleeves are necessary, and then when able, um, plan where you plant so that you can maybe. Um, enjoy the foxgloves in many of those toxic plants in your environment. Well, what if it's too late? Um, remove, the, if, remove the plant from the mouth and wash it out with water. Um, take a picture of the plant, save a sample, and then um, as soon as you can, call Poison Control or the ASPCA um, Poison control center for animals immediately and take direction from them. Used to be that they recommended everybody with young children have syrup of epicac in your, um, your medicine cabinet and they don't anymore. Certain plants, especially those with cardiac glycosides, can be absorbed more effectively and converted to the toxic cyanide with syrup, serum of epicac. So there are some plants they don't want you to vomit with. You would go to the hospital and have a, a decontamination procedure there. Um, so before you do that, um, get instruction, and again, the fairy princess, um, we got instruction that said, yes, give her syrup of Epicac so she can get rid of the lantana. And then if they recommend that you see a veterinarian or a healthcare provider, do so as instructed. Um, and just a little note from Poison Control, 47% of all calls to their hotline are for children under the age of six. So um, know your thief. Could you please explain that again um, as far as uh, not uh, inducing vomiting? So if you have a emetic like syrup of Epicac um, in the household, used to be everybody that had kids was told in your medicine chest you should have syrup of Epicac. If they, you know, swallow bleach or something like that, then we're going to make you, you know, you're going to give it to them and have them vomit. And um, they don't recommend that anymore. They would rather you call first because certain toxins, one, you don't want it to bring it back up because it can cause more harm coming up than it did down, especially if it's caustic. Yeah. Um, they get a double dose. And then some of the cardiac glycosides, um, the syrup of Epicac, the chemicals in that can make it be resorbed more quickly, so more toxic or can convert the pre-toxin into the full toxin so that it's more toxic. So again, the cardiac glycosides are an example where syrup of Epicac is not recommended. Other plants, they're gonna say yes, you know, go get syrup of Epicac and make them vomit and you probably don't need to go to the ER. In fact, only about 30% of um, the toxicities require an ER visit. Most can be managed at home. Um, my little dog, uh couple of years ago got into Halloween candy and I had wrappers all over my house. I didn't realize, you know, he would get into it. I called the vet and they recommend that I give him a spoonful of peroxide okay. to get him to throw up. Oh yeah. Is that bad? Um, it may or may not cause them to throw up and can you hold that question in yeah. and we'll come back and talk about that. Yeah. Just just um, just because I'll tell you when it when it is bad. Yeah. One more. So, what was the type of toxin that you don't want to induce the vomit? Well, there's many, and so that's why some of the saponins and cardiac glycosides definitely are no, and that's why calling poison control and you can call poison control for both animals and kids. So, the general poison control number will help you with anything, um, <clears throat> but they will tell you whether or not you need to induce vomiting or not because some. Um, and not just cardiac glycosides, but the cardiac glycosides are definitely one that they will say, don't use syrup of Epicac. So what do you need to know? There, here's a host of things you need to know. What's the plant? You know, ideally the botanical name. name. I was amazed at how many, um, how many in the report, in the 2022 report, had plant unknown, plant unknown, plant unknown in, in the toxicity that was called. So a lot of people don't know the plant. 
So ideally know your plants, maybe record them somewhere, the amount, estimated amount eaten, what part of the plant was consumed. So the lamp down, my daughter consumed the flower. Um, the time that it was consumed, was it a single or multiple ingestion or over a period of time? Um, age, weight of the child, person, or animal. Had they been eaten or, or not fed? Um, any underlying health conditions? And then again, just a reminder, don't give emetics without direction. And then you have a number of resources. So here are the numbers, and these are in your handouts. Um, human uh, poison control, the central number is that 1222. And they will route you to one of uh, 55 regional poison controls who really know about the plants and, and concerns in that area. Um, both people and animals, and it is free. Um, veterinarians typically use the ASPCA.org hotline, um, which is the, the Animal Poison Control Center. And then this, this animal poison control center, I think, is out of um, either Illinois or Indiana. And so there are fees for the animal um, sources. They have a little more information and can provide direct therapy um, recommendations. So as a veterinarian, I usually use the ASPCA.org. Um, but if you're calling from home, I guess I would probably start with human poison control because they're free and they also manage these as well. So they kind of know the toxicities. And then in terms of helping know what plants you have, um, there's a variety of resources. I think my two favorite, besides Knox County Master Gardeners, <laughs> is um, the, there's a list of toxic and non-toxic plants from the ASPCA. We can go to their website and look at toxic plants and you can choose whether you want to look at just dogs, cats, or horses. Um, and the North Carolina Extension Gardener Plant Toolbox, that's an excellent site, and that has, um, overall, has extensive information about the plant, the plant care, and how toxic it is, and what the toxic principle is. And so, um, were I to kind of survey, sit down and survey my yard, that was probably would be where I would start. So to conclude, um, there's a lot of plants in our environments. I don't really think we can exclude all of them. Um, they're toxic to pets, people, um, livestock, they can cause serious illness and death, and so be aware of those that are highly toxic. And um, common toxicities, if you look at the Poison Control Center for children, the most common toxicity that I saw is oxalate toxicity. So that, you know, many of the philodendron and monstera that people have chewed, or that kids have chewed on that cause burning and pain in the mouth. And some people will say if you give them a little sip of milk if they're really uncomfortable, um, that's okay, but I, I would be somewhat cautious if they're vomiting because we don't want them to aspirate. And then top plants and pets for me is lily and sago plums. So know your plant, prevent access, and know where to find help. So those are, those are kind of the conclusions and the references are um, both in your handout and here. Um, so going back to the question, because it was a little longer answer, which is why um, I wanted to tell you that. So yes, things that are reported for home remedies for dogs are maybe a saturated salt solution, which in my mind is fairly ineffective, but you could certainly try that, um, and um, hydrogen peroxide. So 3% hydrogen peroxide, usually a tablespoon for a big dog. Um, I, the reason I went, mm, is because they may not be all that effective. Um, trying it once may be helpful. Um, I have certainly done endoscopy on animals where I have looked down the esophagus and the stomach and it is just raw because the hydrogen peroxide was given over and over and over again mm -hmm. because it was difficult and the animal um, wasn't vomiting so they just continued to yeah. administer those. So once may be helpful if you've been advised by your veterinarian or the ER but if that doesn't work, then go ahead and bring them in. We've got very effective medics um, that are available now that we can kind of put an eye drop in and they vomit and then we rinse it out. We can stop the vomiting and so, and they can be, um, if it's really highly toxic, we might wanna go ahead and do additional decontamination procedures, which can sometimes include gastric lavage and this would be the same you and I, gastric lavage, um, activated charcoal to absorb the toxins. Those are some things that if they're highly toxic and we can't vomit it all out, we may go ahead and follow up with those to protect it from being absorbed. And so I wouldn't wait around a long time. You know, if you got that message, go ahead and, and give them an amount. 
yes, and then if nothing happens other than they salivate, which is often what happens, um, then get to the ER, have them give a, pro a proper emetic. They can monitor the animal that way so that when they're vomiting, they hopefully won't aspirate any of that into their lungs, and, and then they can you know, determine whether or not additional treatment needs to be done. So that's my concern with um, some of these over-the-counter or home remedies for vomiting um, for dogs and cats. And in children, it will be syrup of Epicac, but usually um, they, you know, we don't keep it in the house anymore, and so they'll usually tell you that, you know, kind of run to the urgent care and go ahead and um, they may give them syrup of Epicac if it's a child to make them vomit. Other questions? I wanted to ask about brown cherries in the same family as the Chinese lantern. Absolutely the same. Thank you, great question. So Chinese lantern, Tomatillo, brown cherries, those are all listed as toxin. Again, fruits, completely edible, no problem whatsoever. But fruits with husks, no. So, um, and so as I said, lots of times it's not so much not to completely excluding every toxic plant, because I don't think you can, and we enjoy so many of them, but making sure you know what's toxic, you know, who's likely to get poisoned, um, what your resources should that happen. Um, I'm very honest, my cat keeps eating the aloe vera and other than thank goodness for the warm weather so I can get the plant out of the house and exclude it. Um, it causes mild vomiting in her and no other further signs. But, but the fruit of the ground cherry is okay? Just like fruit the of the ground cherry is okay, but the, um, the rest of the plant is not. So kind of like the tomato. The tomato is you know, lovely for us, and dogs and cats can eat tomato fruit, but the leaves um, can mm -hmm. cause, in that plant, mild GI upset, and other plants, <clears throat> and other nightshade plants, like the deadly nightshade, and um, that's gonna be highly toxic. Mm -hmm. um, that are effective. Other questions that you have? It's not a toxicity question, so you can decline this if you want to, but, <laughs> I know a number of people who say they are allergic to tomatoes, the fruit. Oh, yes. Is that on the scale of toxicity, or is an allergy completely different than toxicity? Um, an, an allergy, well, hmm, that's a good question. That's a good question, Martha. Um, so in generally, an allergy would normally be considered different than a toxicity, but I would tell you that the exception especially would be poison ivy and poison oak because it's a contact allergy so that um, the oils in the poison sumac, poison oak, poison ivy, contact the skin, bind, create a unique protein that when it's combined with the oil that the body um, recognizes as foreign and attacks it um, as a what's called a type four allergy, a delayed hypersensitivity. So that is an allergic contact reaction. A lot of the contact dermatitis that we have are kind of bridge that, you know, both toxin and um, allergic reaction. Tomatoes actually do have a direct immune response as in some people, and whether it's to the scopolamine or some other component of the tomato, I don't actually know that. My guess would be it's very much the tomato. So people who have strawberry allergies and um, you know muscle allergies and any other food allergies, it's often proteins or or what's called glycopeptides, which is a sugar um, small protein molecule that the immune system doesn't recognize as supposed to be there, and so has an exuberant reaction, which. Um, same thing with shellfish and peanuts and things like that. And you can have a, a minor reaction to some of those, or you can have a fatal reaction. You know, for people who have shellfish and uh, tree nut allergies, those can be far more deadly. Um, tomatoes and strawberries usually make people feel really crummy, um, but that's an allergic reaction, unless they're eating the leaves. <laughs> Long-winded answer, sorry. <laughs> yes? Um. When I was researching skin um, for myself, tulips came up and it mentioned that people who handle tulips a lot, florists, and growers, and so forth, would get their fingers would get something. Can you, for those that might have a lot of tulips? Yeah, and again, there's, there's some um, resins 
um, in, in the uh, bulbs in particular, but certainly some of the plants. So if you cut a tulip, you notice a little white resin that has come. And so many of the plants, I don't know specifically the uh, direct toxic principle of that, but a lot of those resins when exposed to the skin can cause a contact dermatitis. So either direct irritation or somewhat similar to poison oak, but a, a little more of a acute reaction where there is an irritant in it. And then other plants, as we said, calcium oxalate. Mm -hmm. Crystals, if you're handling, I mean, if anybody hits stinging nettles, you kind of know that that can cause quite the reaction quite mm -hmm. quickly. But yeah, tulips, those bulbs in it's particular. It's more the bulb set. It's not so much stems and tulips. Right, yeah, it's the, it's the bulb set. And that's the same irritant that can cause the GI signs mm -hmm. on those as well. And I think it's, I think it's called lycarine, as I recall what, what that is, um, the compound that's in the bulbs um, that can do that. So mm -hmm. uh, again, didn't focus too much on the derm side effects because I think those are irritating, but not as mm -hmm. uh, concerned as the, the kind of metabolic changes that you can see with toxicities. Mm -hmm. uh, and the trick is wear gloves and wash your hands. Mm -hmm. Another plant that I've seen, especially at UT Gardens, that's been coming up, and I think the birds are planting it, is Italian arum. And when the stalk comes up and it's got the red berries on it, I know my grandson got into those, and the burning, you know, was, and, and it, it seems to be more common. I'm never seeing it now in a lot of places. Well, but yeah, there's so many of them, and the list of, of plants that can cause um, skin reactions is extremely broad, so even even broader. And there's a lot of plants, even some of the non-toxic plants, I guess I should mention, um, the fact that they are not listed as a toxic plant. If you need enough, eat enough of them, you can have GI side effects. So um, there are some that you know may be mildly irritating when eaten in large amounts, but are not truly toxic, meaning they don't have a chemical component that um, has a direct effect on the metabolic system of the animal. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is the plants defending themselves. Yeah, <laughs> lots, of times, lots of times, lots of times. You know, when you see deer proof, you probably should check the toxicity of that plant because mm -hmm. that plant has come up with a plan. <laughs> and, and it is, thou shalt not eat me. <laughs> so, yeah. So, thanks everybody for, for oh, being thank here. You.